Watch more programs like this on cable and stream with PCN Select. Subscribe at PCNTV.com. This program has been paid for by the sponsor and does not reflect the views of PCN. Welcome to another edition of PHRC Speaks, Fair Housing in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Adrian Garcia, Director of the Fair Housing and Commercial Property Division for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Stella Adams is a nationally recognized fair housing and fair lending expert and a lifelong activist in the struggle for civil and human rights. Welcome, Stella. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Adrian. It's my honor to be here today. When did you discover, or how did you discover, that civil rights and social justice in housing was a calling for you? Well, you know, um, I come from, I guess it's a family business. <laughs> I come from a background where my um, great-grandfather and mother on my mother side were strongly engaged in civil and civil rights and human rights um, early in over a hundred years ago. Um, my great grandfather um, was engaged actually um, with um, Joe Lewis in um, trying to get racial, um, racial justice in Philadelphia back in the day. So this is, um, you know, um, my grand, my great grandmother um, was one of the um, earliest Black women to get a formal education at Shaw University's, um, and so I am fourth generation, and my daughter's fifth generation um, college-educated Black woman. So, um, so that's that feminist side <laughs> as well. Um, and then in terms of housing justice um, and fair housing, we were the, we integrated um, our neighborhood that I grew up in um, when I was coming up. And so I experienced firsthand what um, integrating a, a white neighborhood was like. Um, when we moved in, they changed the rules and turned all the um, sort of recreational facilities into private clubs. Hmm. So that had been previously available to anyone who had purchased a home there when they found out that our family had purchased a home, then they changed the rules. Um, so housing discrimination has a particular interest. Um, that's kind of how I got into fair housing. Um, and I was doing civil rights. I was told, I think I was maybe nine when I got involved in my first um, action. And um, I helped um, bring um, uh, so civil rights for people with disabilities to my high school. So I've been in the game a long time, long time. <laughs> Absolutely. Are there any other instances that you could recall that are kind of highlighted in your minds where, you know, it, it took action from you personally in order to, to actuate the change and to see something happen? Yeah, I think... Um, the, in high school, um, I was walking, I was late to class, walking um, down in my high school, and it was the first year that they had um, integrated people with disabilities into regular schools and classrooms. And my high school, on the first floor, there was a little, a couple of little steps. You were still on. Um, technically the first store, but you went up a couple of steps to get to the other side. 
to get to the auditorium and then you went down a couple of steps to get to the other wing of the school. And I was running late to class and there was a young woman who be, it was a um, amazing young woman ended up being a city councilman, but um, she was stuck. She was in a wheelchair and um, she couldn't get down that one little step without somebody helping her, right? And so she was just stuck there. And if I hadn't walked by, she would probably remain there until somebody came by. And I was um, head of the human relations. We had junior human relations councils in high schools um, in Durham. And I was head of human relations. I was like, this is terrible. And so um, I did my first um, investigation of a civil rights violation. Um, my Another one of my classmates was on crutches. And um, it never dawned on me how many steps he had to climb a day until I had to help lift her down that one step. And he was um, climbing over 200 steps a day just to get to class and the library and to go to lunch and, and that kind of thing. And so um, we protested, but the school was up for accreditation and um, we protested and went to the accreditation and board and said, don't give them the accreditation because it's not, um, it's not um, accessible. And um, using um, 504, um, the next year we had um, ramps and um, curb cuts and all that cool wow. stuff. And classes were arranged in a different way. And until they tore that school down, I would drive by and say to my kids, you see that ramp? That's my ramp right there. So, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Stella Adams ramp, absolutely. That's a great story. I mean, you clearly, you clearly were born into this work, and so oh, oh yeah. One of the what this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation, in particular, because we were setting up for another panel discussion, and we somehow got into the discussion of wealth disparity in, in communities of color, disinvestment in communities of color, and a lot of people don't don't understand. Uh, or, or don't make the connection of how important that is and how it is that it's affecting everyone today. When I mean everyone, mm -hmm. I mean everyone. It affects everyone mm -hmm. um, in terms of the disinvestment in, in schools. I mean, schools today are not all uh, African-American. They're not all Hispanic. They're not all white. They're not all X. They are very diverse. And so when you mm -hmm. have a disinvestment in a community, it affects everyone. And you spoke to me uh, during that conversation regarding Black Wall Street. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you wouldn't mind kind of touching that a little bit and, and also uh, seeing how incidents like that affect us still today and permeate still today. So as you know, there's been a lot of um, attention drawn to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma as they commemorated the 100th anniversary of the um, massacre of um, black folks in, in Tulsa and the destruction of um, Tulsa's um, Black Wall Street. Um, Tulsa was not the only Black Wall Street but um, but how it ended is often what happened to other communities as well. Um, in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, it was destroyed. Um, its town, um, there was the first and only um, coup d'etat of an elected body of officials took place 
in Tulsa, Tulsa was um, a, had uh, a beautiful situation. They they had money. Um, they had their own banking system. They had um, thriving black businesses. Black farmers had access to capital and credit um, that allowed them. There was home ownership. There was wealth building, wealth building. And the incident was sparked by um, an allegation that a um, black um, elevator operator um, disrespected a white woman um, as she was on the elevator. And that then um, is the alleged, you know, history has its um, fables, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the alleged start of this um, instigation of this um, massacre. But what we fail to think about is some of the trauma. The, there was a bombing a building um, by aircraft. Hmm. And there's photos of it, right? Who a hundred years ago had bombs and aircraft except for the government, mm -hmm. right? That, that's not something that was just out there. Everybody had their own little bomb, right? And so what we fail to understand is the collusion and corruption that um, was government participation in the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa. And um, in a, and you notice that I say Black Wall Street in Tulsa because I live in Durham, North Carolina, where what amounts to the surviving Black Wall Street exists. Hmm. And at the time of the massacre in Tulsa, um, the Black financiers were building on Paris Street, on Black Wall Street. And they changed the design of the buildings to mimic the height of the other buildings in that street in order not to draw attention from the white community that might be negative. They were trying to avoid another massacre situation. And so, and yet, and those institutions have survived for 115 years, but there were conscious choices made to make sure history didn't repeat itself, or at that time, that they did not attract that kind of negative attention to um, the wealth that they were building and accumulating. Um, and, you know, we see the results of that, right? Is that in Oklahoma, um, you don't have the home ownership, you know, the, the lands and, and our farmers, we went from having over a um, hundred million acres of land to now we have maybe a million acres of um, land owned by black farmers. Black farmers to this day to this day, cannot get the financing they need to support their farms. They're discriminated against. It's a public policy violence by the USDA. Um, women farmers are violated. But when you had 
we had over, we only have left out of all the black financial institutions, we only have left about 49 historically black financial institutions in the country. When we had over um, 200 at the time that Tulsa burnt down. Mm. Right? And it was those, it was those financial institutions that supported the black community that was redlined and prohibited from getting funding by the white community. Um, if you didn't have that black bank, you didn't have home ownership. If you didn't have that black bank, you didn't have small businesses owned by um black folks, if you didn't have that black bank, right, then you didn't have um, money for farmers, right? In Durham, the financial institution was called Mechanics and Farmers. So it was funding small business, its purpose was to fund small businesses and to fund local farmers. We have in Durham, I'm, I'm trying to show you, what it means if you have that stability versus you getting bombed and burned out, right? Absolutely. In Durham, in the county of Durham, there is a 75% home ownership rate in the county where the farmers are. That's unheard of, right? Mm -hmm. A black home ownership rate of 75%? It certainly doesn't follow the national average. <laughs> in a rural community, right? Yeah. yeah. But the stability of the farmers being able to get a loan from mechanics and farmers versus trying to get a loan from mm -hmm. USDA is yeah. it's a difference, and it's a different in it. And the black wealth in Durham, W. E. B. Du Bois. I'm, I'm trying to. When Tulsa was bombed, I'm trying to show you what the destruction meant, right? And then I'll let you ask the next question. But W.E.B. Du Bois said that when he went to Durham, it was the only place he had ever gone to in America where you could wake up in the morning and never spend a dime. You could lay down on a bed made by a black person. You could go to a restaurant. You could spend your entire life and not spend a dime with a person that was not black. That's how economically strong. That's what was destroyed. You know, and I, I think it's brilliant the way you kind of tied that together because it did very much lead into the redlining. What we saw was we saw an affluent African American community mm -hmm. be destroyed by one incident. Mm -hmm. And when I say affluent, I mean, I read somewhere where there were, there were African-American families that had their own planes. In that's Tulsa. right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the affluence. That's the wealth building. And, and it becomes generational. So when you come back to the present day and you say we've gone from 100 million acres to, to, uh, to uh, a million acres, that's a huge effect. That's a huge stunt in, in building wealth. My question is, now that we have this kind of, kind of coming out to the general public and COVID has also brought it to the forefront, what do you see that is going on uh, nationally or regionally that is making a positive impact in trying to reverse some of these effects? One, we see a resurgence in the commitment to civil and human rights. Um, we have a number of executive orders that are um, requiring um, executive um, agencies to look at their civil rights profile and to um, affirmatively um, further civil rights and fair housing. Um, and so for the first time in a long time, in, in decades, you have 
departments of transportation, Department of Commerce, the Defense Department, um, Agriculture, um, all looking internally and and developing um, sophisticated regulations and guidance around civil rights. Um, people don't, are not aware, but actually it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture that has the most pu um, publicly funded housing in the nation. Federally funded housing is not at HUD. Mm. It's at the Department of Agriculture. And so penetrating that system and, um, and getting those programs to look through an equity lens to correct some of the latent um, discrimination and redlining that was done by the Department of Agriculture is critical, but it's also critical to look at the Department of Transportation and where we're in this huge amount of investment um, that the federal government is making an infrastructure. What neighborhoods does that infrastructure go through? The development of the interstate commerce system destroyed more black communities in, in, in this country. If you look at New Orleans, if you look at um, urban settings, Philadelphia, if you look at different, um, Houston is amazing how they destroyed mm -hmm. the black community in Houston through um, the interstate highway system, just kind of bulldozing over that land um, through and using eminent domain. So this is, you know, making these agencies look through this lens is the most important positive step and can be um, a really strong um, building block towards um, reversing some of the damage that's been done. Absolutely, absolutely well said. So I have, uh, with the five minutes I have left, I wanna ask you a question that I've been kind of pondering in my own head and, and certainly here at the PHRC, we're trying to kind of head in this direction. But as someone that has been in this game for so long, you know as well as I do, we've been doing civil rights in the same manner for the last 50 to 100 years, right? When we talk about it to all groups, we kind of follow a formula, right? So let me ask you, based on your experience and your boots on the ground experience, is it time perhaps to start tailoring the message to the various groups in order to get them to lean in? I'm not saying we water down the message. What I'm saying is that we need to be able to talk to bankers a certain way so that they can lean in and see the, the reality of how this is affecting entire communities regardless of a protected class. We need to speak to developers in a certain way so that they can see the we in the argument and the why in the argument. What do you say? Well, I think I've always done that. Mm -hmm. um, um, some call it code switching, but um, really it's kind of meeting people where they are, yeah. right? Yeah. So what is your motivation? Now, if you're dealing with a stone cold racist, right? right. Their motivation, right. you can't undo, right? But the majority of people are not racist, but, and if, and calling people racist when they're enacting or proposing um, discriminatory um, or things that are going to have a discriminatory impact um, shuts their ears down so they can't hear, right? Mm -hmm. Most businessmen, and that's bankers too, want to make money. Okay. They, they want to do that. And so you have to look at what are the public policies and, and what are the business interests, right, um, that you want them to focus on. And so when um, dealing with bankers, I, I met a banker who, um, and this is why I know community reinvestment 
works. And I know that if you send that message the right way, it impacts the community and it impacts the bank. And so there was a small bank in, called the First Bank of Troy in North Carolina, teeny tiny little bank, but they um, were, they got caught. And we talked to their um, management team at the time. At the time, and and he was like, "What? No, we want every person that we can get to be in our bank." And the commitment to the training, the CEO came and told every person working there, "I expect you to get make every loan." that we are capable of making, right? And treat every person with respect. His commitment as CEO to make sure everybody knew that he meant that, and it wasn't just um, um, PR, it was real. There was a small recession back in the early 2000s. It wasn't, um, and they suffered the same level of loss of white borrowers during that period of time. But because they had been committed to lending to everybody, they did not suffer the same level of losses as similar banks. In, their, in fact, they thrived hmm. because they had that diversified portfolio and that diversified um, commitment. And you know this, that black and brown borrowers, when they get those loans from a bank, they will make sure that that payment is made if they don't Absolutely. eat. They don't eat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They won't eat. Don't pay that they bill. They won't eat. <laughs> they won't eat. They will work hard to make Making that payment on time is the critical piece. If they yeah. get that loan, they'll, they'll fight to keep that loan. Um, and so, um, yeah. Then, and so, who was at the time? The CF, the COO was like, you know, I noticed this. So, even when the, the first CEO retired, the second CEO kept that commitment and then the current CEO was always was was attracted to the bank because of that commitment and it is and what they do now is they go they buy the branches of uh, the rural branches of banks that are getting out of rural communities and they're keeping the rural branches open Hmm. Right. So that farmers still have access and people still have access. So you can you can convert a bank and convince a bank if you talk bank. Right. right. Profit That's a very good loss. Point. Yes. Talk about profit and loss and have them look at look at the rate. You know, unless a person loses their job, the family will um, make those payments if they're given that opportunity. Oh, Stella, I, you know, I could spend an hour uh, talking to you. Mm -hmm. I really, really appreciate your time. I know that you have a very busy schedule, but uh, we'll get together again in the future. and we'll, we'll pick it up where we left off. But I want to thank you so much for being here on PHR 60. Thank you so much for having me. And, and remember, people, that we're all in this struggle together. Absolutely. So for more information, or if you believe that you've been a victim of discrimination in a housing transaction, you can visit us online at www.phrc.pa.gov, or you can call us at 717-787-9780. We're also pretty easy to find online on Facebook, PA Human Relations, and we also are on Twitter at PA underscore HumRelCom. That's it for this edition of PHRC Speaks. Until next time, take care, be good, and be fair to each other. This program has been paid for by the sponsor and does not reflect the views of PCN. 
To get your program on PCN Fusion and for more information, contact info at PCNTV.com.